Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, uh, coming out here this evening and what better day could we have had uh, to pave the way for coming out tonight and enjoying Dr. Ragasta's talk. Uh, my name is Bill Barker. I portray Mr. Jefferson here in persona and uh, my honor to introduce John for his talk this evening. Uh, you know, John is a, an award-winning author and a historian, a lawyer, and a beekeeper living here in Charlottesville. He is currently a historian at the Robert H. Smith in International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. He is the author of Religious Freedom, Jefferson's Legacy, America's Creed, University of Virginia Press, 2013, and Wellspring of Liberty, how Virginia's religious dissenters helped to win the American Revolution and secured religious liberty, Oxford University Press, 2010. He published Patrick Henry, Proclaiming a Revolution, Routledge, 2017, as a precursor to his most recent book, For the People, For the Country, Patrick Henry's Final Political Battle, the University of Virginia Press, 2023. He has taught history and law at the University of Virginia, George Washington University, and Hamilton, Oberlin, and Randolph Colleges. Before returning to academia, Dr. Ragasta was a partner at Dewey Ballantyne, the Washington offices of that law firm. Ragasta has both his PhD and JD from University of Virginia, and he also holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics, Chemistry, with a double major in Philosophy. John, it's all yours. Let's get John to go. I'm surprised Bill didn't say it was the university. Uh, thank you all very much for coming out. I'm very, very pleased and very humbled that you're all here tonight. Uh, thank you especially to Caitlin Lawrence and to Leslie Bradley for helping to arrange things for tonight. But I'm uh, very pleased you're here in part because I want to tell you a story that I think people need to hear about. Uh, and it's a story that's a little bit surprising because it's a story of how the nation was in a crisis in 1798 and 1799 that almost destroyed the Union. And Patrick Henry had a critical role in that. But let me start by telling you the story that got me interested in this project. Because I read a letter that, and it was after I'd finished my PhD, and the letter surprised me. And I hope it surprises you as well, and it's what this project. So the letter is written on January 15th, 1799. It's a mild day, sunny day, outside at Mount Vernon on the banks of the Potomac River. But when you read this letter, you get the sense that George Washington inside is becoming very stormy. You sense him pacing the wide pine boards, and he finally, in anger and frustration, he sits down at his desk, he picks up a sheaf of paper and a quill pen, and the man we know of as the sword of the American Revolution decides to write a long letter to a man we know of as the trumpet of the American Revolution, Patrick Henry. Now, they had not corresponded for years, but on this particular day, George Washington decides he must write Patrick Henry. He tells him there is a crisis when everything dear and valuable to us is assailed. Washington goes on to rail at people who are putting their own personal ambition and their own party politics above country and putting the nation at risk. Measures are systematically and pertinaciously pursued, which must eventually, eventually dissolve the union or produce coercion. And by coercion, George Washington meant the US Army marching on its own citizens. The nation was at risk, the possibility of civil war loomed. George Washington asked Patrick Henry to come out of retirement to help save the nation. Now, Henry was living in retirement as well at Red Hill, almost down on the North Carolina border. He, too, thought he could enjoy retirement under his own vine and fig tree, to use one of Washington's favorite biblical allusions. He had turned down positions as Secretary of State, as Supreme Court Justice, as Senator, as Ambassador to France, Ambassador to Spain. The last time he had communicated with Washington, he told him that he would not come out of retirement unless the nation faced the horrors of anarchy. When he receives Washington's letter in February of 1799, 
He writes back, I accord with every sentiment you express to me. Patrick Henry agrees to come out of retirement to help save the nation. So who were the people putting their own ambition above country? Who was it that was putting the nation at risk of civil war? It's Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and the radical states' rights agenda of the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Now, this was a fascinating story. Patrick Henry comes out of retirement. He runs for office. He wins his election. Patrick Henry always wins his election. But he dies before he can take office. It is said that if Patrick Henry had lived, Thomas Jefferson almost certainly would have never been elected president. So that's the story I came across. And it fascinated me. And I thought, well, I need to find out more about what's going on with this story. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I, I want to talk about three things. First of all, what happened? Why is Patrick Henry, the intellectual godfather of the states' rights movement, coming out of retirement to oppose states' rights? The second, what about Jefferson? If it's true that Jefferson would not have been elected president if Henry had lived, does this tell us something about Thomas Jefferson? Is there something about Jefferson that we've missed or not understood? And third, why was this not a bigger part of history? Why had I never heard of this before? Was it simply a failure of memory or was something else at work here? So let's start in the summer of 1798 and the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, we know that since the Constitution was adopted and George Washington became president, the nation had been plagued with foreign policy issues since the French Revolution. In 1798, the immediate concern was France, a rising Napoleon Bonaparte. It was said that we had a quasi-war with France, that the French had requested a bribe from our peace negotiators, the XYZ affair, and this had resulted in a conflict between the United States and France. Now, it's called a quasi-war, but people were getting shot at. People were getting killed. France had seized over 330 U.S. ships. And the United States is afraid that we might be pulled into the European Napoleonic Wars. The Federalists, the party of John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, responds. They control the Congress. They control the presidency. And they respond in three ways. First, with the Alien Acts, making it far easier to expel aliens who might be a trouble for the United States. Second, they're going to increase the military budget because we might have a war with France, Napoleonic France. And third, and most ominously, they adopt the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act literally makes it illegal to criticize the President of the United States or the U.S. Congress. Now, by the way, you can say anything you want about the Vice President. <laughs> Vice President Thomas Jefferson. You can go to jail for criticizing the President or the Congress. Historians have told us for 150 years that there were 14 indictments under the Sedition Act, 10 convictions or fines. That grossly underestimated the impact. New research uh, has shown that there were over 40 indictments, over 120 people were prosecuted, and they specifically targeted newspaper editors. They targeted the opposition press. They were throwing in jail those people supporting the Democratic Republican Party. Jefferson said this was a reign of witches. He writes to James Madison that if the newspapers fail, Republicanism will be entirely browbeaten. He writes another supporter, to preserve freedom of the press, every spirit should be ready to devote itself to martyrdom. This was a reign of witches, and it was a real crisis. It was a real danger to the nation to throw in jail people of the political opposition. What do you do if you're Jefferson and Madison? Well, the first thing you would do is you have an election. You win the election. You throw the bums out. You repeal those laws. You pass different laws. Of course, that's the way the system's supposed to operate. But Jefferson's afraid maybe that won't work this time. First of all, we have a quasi-war with France. It won't be the first nor the last time where a foreign policy conflict had an effect on domestic policy 
domestic politics. John Adams is personally popular for the first and only time in his life. He's actually taken to wearing a sword to public appearances. And then with the XYZ affair, Jefferson is concerned that maybe the election won't work. Add to that the Sedition Act, where you're throwing in jail our newspaper editors. Well, maybe the election won't work. What do you do? What are your options? Well, the second option that Jefferson should have fallen on immediately is you sue the buggers. It's unconstitutional. It's a violation of the First Amendment. You get the Sedition Act thrown out in court. And by the way, this is, of course, before Marbury versus Madison, but they were well aware of judicial review. Jefferson had spoken about it, Madison, Henry, Hamilton. They had all endorsed the idea of judicial review. But there's a problem. Five of the six sitting Supreme Court justices had taken part in Sedition Act cases and not raised a whisper about its constitutionality. The First Amendment is still developing. The idea of freedom of the press is still developing. And if you sue them and you lose, and the Supreme Court seems to endorse the Sedition Act, you're worse off. So what do you do? They came upon a third option. They were going to turn to the states and seek the state's support against the federal government. Now, this had been done before. Patrick Henry, after all, had led the state opposition to Hamilton's financial plan. Henry, when he was in the Virginia legislature, had a remonstrance drafted, sent to the Congress, saying that this is wrong, it's unconstitutional, it must stop. But Jefferson wants to do more. A simple protest wasn't enough. So Jefferson resurrects the idea that the United States was a mere compact of independent states, a confederacy, and that a state could nullify, that's Jefferson's term, could nullify a federal law that they thought was unconstitutional. A state could interpose between the federal government and the people and stop federal law. This is what was stated in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. If this was true, we would have a different federal law in each state. We would have the federal government against the states, the states having different laws, state against state. If the United States is a mere compact of independent states, succession is a real possibility. In 1799, Jefferson writes one supporter that determined were we to be disappointed in this repeal of the Alien and Sedition Act, to sever ourselves from that union we so much value. Jefferson is actively discussing secession. There are reports that Virginia is arming. Virginia is buying muskets. People say it may be for a conflict with the federal government. One Virginia militia officer is quoted as saying, if the French invade and land on our shores, I will take my troops to the tricolor rather than the stars and stripes carried by a political opponent. This is open treason and it's being reported in the newspapers. This is the second crisis. We have the reign of witches, but Jefferson's response creates a second crisis. And this is what caused George Washington and Patrick Henry such concern, a threat of civil war. Newspapers carried the headline, Civil War in 1799. Great battle of American history, largely forgotten. And Patrick Henry's role is particularly poignant Patrick Henry, after all, was the leading anti-federalist during the ratification debates. Patrick Henry had argued that the federal government was going to be too powerful, too distant from the people, and we shouldn't ratify the Constitution. In 1799, he comes out of retirement to defend the Constitution that he had opposed. He makes his final speech on March 4th, 1799 at Charlotte Courthouse. It said, and this speech, by the way, is very well reported, which is not always the case for Henry's speeches. It said that he seemed sick, he seemed weak, he seemed old. He, he rose to speak and he had a gray cast about him. He was probably suffering from the, the, the illness that would have killed him three months later. But as he began to speak, a wonderful transformation came over Henry. He rose up, his voice rang out as it had during the revolution. And he says, what has happened has planted thorns upon my pillow. Henry has a way with words. 
He says that Virginia is to the Union as Charlotte County is to Virginia. Virginia has no more right to block the laws of the Union than Charlotte County has to block the laws of Virginia. Such opposition on the part of Virginia to the acts of the general government must beget their enforcement by military power, civil war, foreign alliances. He warns the gathered thousands that Virginia is going to face a federal army led by George Washington. And who will dare to lift his hand against the father of his country, to point a weapon at the breast of the man who often led them to battle and to victory? It's an 18th century election. People had been drinking. Someone, and, and we know it's a gentleman named John Harvey. Someone goes, I would. <laughs> Henry, this was a mistake. Henry turns on him, rises up. You dare not do it. In such a parricidal attempt, the steel would drop from your nerveless arm. This is classic Henry. If the administration has done wrong, let us all go wrong. Together, united, we stand. Divided, we fall. Is the federal government too powerful? He says, it is necessary to submit to the constitutional exercise of that power. If you disagree with the federal government, Henry says, go to the ballot box. Go to the ballot box. You can never exchange the present government but for a monarchy. I think what Henry is saying very clearly to the group, he reminds them of his opposition to the Constitution. And he says, I warned you. I warned you that this was going to happen. I warned you the federal government was going to be too large. I warned you they were going to be too powerful. I warned you they would interfere with your rights. But we agreed. I didn't agree. But we, the people, agreed. And if we can't live within the Constitution that we adopted, then the only possibility is monarchy. Henry defines for America in its youth, what it meant to be loyal opposition to the government. He dies on June 6th of that year. John Randolph of Roanoke, who was a Jeffersonian at the time, is the one who says if Henry had lived, Jefferson would have never been elected president. So that's what Henry's doing. What about Jefferson? Is there something about Jefferson that maybe we've missed? Most histories, when speaking of Jefferson in the 1790s, have the 1798 Alien and Sedition Act followed by the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions and then the Revolution of 1800, Jefferson wins. And it's all neat and clean and it one follows from the other. But in fact, that's a very misleading record of history. After the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, there's a midterm election and the Democratic Republicans take a shellacking in those midterm elections. The Federalist Party in the Deep South, in South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina had four representatives in Congress. After the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, they have 12, because people think, thought that the Democratic Republicans were talking about succession and disunion. In Virginia, John Marshall, we remember him, Henry Lighthorse, Harry Lee, are elected to Congress as Federalists with the assistance of Patrick Henry. Jefferson later complains he's astonished that these people could be elected. It is a taint in that part of the state which I had not expected. One wonders over the next 30 years as he's fighting with John Marshall whether he remembers that it was Patrick Henry that got John Marshall elected to Congress and therefore appointed to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> but here's the thing about Jefferson. He and Madison realized after those midterm elections and realized fairly quickly they had made a mistake. They had gone too far. Of course, they can't say that. They're politicians. But Madison writes Jefferson eight days after the Virginia resolutions are adopted. Now, Madison drafted the Virginia resolutions. These are his resolutions. He writes Jefferson within eight days. It is to be feared their zeal, the Virginia legislature, which just adopted his resolution, their zeal may forget some considerations which ought to temper their proceedings. The charge of usurpation in the very act of protesting against the usurpations of Congress. Madison and Jefferson are backpedaling and they're backpedaling fast. 
1798, the Democratic Republicans were openly challenging the federal government to indict somebody under the Sedition Act in the South. They were threatening to break them out of jail. They said, go ahead, indict somebody in the South and see what happens. In 1800, James Callender, we remember James Callender, he's the fellow who's gonna talk about Sally Hemings three years later. James Callender is indicted under the Sedition Act. He's put in jail in Richmond, and James Monroe, the new governor of Richmond, of Virginia, writes Jefferson and Madison and says, don't do anything stupid. Don't try to directly attack federal law. Let's let this play out. And suddenly the election becomes not about states' rights, but about a too powerful federal government interfering with freedom of the press. And so Jefferson and Madison shift. Nullification is tabled. They don't talk about that anymore. It's tabled until the fire eaters bring it back up in the 1820s, and then it explodes over Fort Sumter in 1861. President Jefferson, after he's elected in 1800, is chastened. It is said since Jefferson became president, people have been saying he was a hypocrite because he wouldn't do as president the things he'd been saying in the 1790s that he would do. I don't think Jefferson was so much a hypocrite as he was chastened. He realized some of the things he had been saying in the 1790s in the hyper-partisan atmosphere of the 1790s was crazy. He won at the ballot box. He didn't win by directly opposing federal policies. And if you reread Jefferson's first inaugural address with this in mind, it takes on an entirely different voice. The only thing anybody remembers from that inaugural address is we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. But read the whole document. We unite in common efforts for the common good. He says, I realize why the Federalists were afraid of France invading. It's a remarkable statement for Jefferson to make. He's saying what unites us is more important than what divides us. Ironically, the fact that Jefferson won the presidency diffuses the crisis. Had Jefferson lost, he and Madison might have been back to the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions and that dispute between the federal government and the states. It's an enormous irony that the revolution of 1800 resolves the possible revolution of 1799. And then let's turn to the third thing. Because it's equally interesting to me is why is this story not better known? Why is Henry not better known? Perhaps Patrick Henry is more important than he has been given credit. After all, Henry, even Jefferson says that Henry gave the first impulse to the ball of the revolution. It's not now easy to say what we should have done without Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry leads opposition to the Stamp Act when the opposition was a dead letter with his Caesar had his Brutus speech. The liberty or death speech, about the only thing anyone ever knows about Patrick Henry. Seven words he said at St. John's Church in 1775. That speech was about arming. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? And in a very tough vote, Henry wins to arm for a possible civil war. Henry becomes the first governor of the state of Virginia. He's critically important in getting supplies to Valley Forge. He helps defuse the Conway cabal that was seeking to replace George Washington as leader of the Continental Army. He's critical in sending George Rogers Clark out to the Northwest Territory. He's the leading anti-federalist in opposition to ratification of the Constitution, playing a critical role, therefore, in getting the Bill of Rights adopted. Because if the anti-federalists had not made a good case, we wouldn't have a Bill of Rights. He creates the critique of the Constitution, the intellectual basis of what becomes Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party. And in 1799, he models what it means to be a loyal opposition. He's on everyone's short list in 1776 of leading founders. In 1786, probably the same is true in 1796. But why is he not better known? Well, a part of it, um, he's responsible. Because uh, as I tell people, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, all of these people were really very, very concerned with what you and I were gonna be thinking about them 200 years later. They preserved their papers. We have some of the people from the papers here. They, they're, they're very concerned about how their image will be re reflected. Henry doesn't seem to care much. The letters, some of the letters he has, he destroys. 
Second, in opposing the Constitution and refusing to take federal office, he could have been Supreme Court, he could have been Secretary of State. He's sort of on the wrong side of history. But I think there's something else. He's directly 